Um, before starting, I just wanted to thank Nancy and everyone who put the event together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Alex Guillon. I, I joined the department in uh, 2012. And if you look at the document uh, brochure and website department, you always see these five pictures, right? This uh, fusion reactor, then this uh, picture on boiling. Then you have this turbulent CFD picture, future of nuclear power, and then this quantum systems. And today I'll show you the new understanding that we have on boiling itself uh, at the micro scale level. Um, two sponsors currently, uh, EDF, French Utility and R&D Center, and CEA, French National Lab. Uh, usually we all encounter boiling every day or so, um, boiled water to cook pasta, you boil water to prepare your tea. It doesn't sound like a very exciting experiment. So that's why a group in Twente University, they, they give you a, with this short video, um, kind of an ex enhanced experience on, on boiling inside a kettle. So what you'll see here is, is, uh, is all the different regimes that you go through with boiling. Uh, here you have a heated surface at the bottom. This is a liquid on top of it, and the line that you see is the level of liquid in the kettle. I'll start a video now, and you'll pay attention at the, at the, at the bottom. You see all these bubbles starts to grow, the parts. This is an infrared image that tells you all the bright spots there are hot and the dark spots are cold. You see the bubble departs from the wall, carry the heat away from the wall, and the wall cools down. Now, if you pay attention to the structures at the wall, you see that the bubbles grow bigger and bigger. In other words, those tiny initial bubbles, they coalesce with others, they create larger structures until they reach a point where they all coalesce into a film. And you see here, it looks like it posed. The whole dynamics is slowed down. This is film boiling. This is what we call the boiling crisis. Um, this is particularly relevant in nuclear engineering. Um, if we summarize why we're here today, do, you know, building nuclear power plants in, in a few steps, I would say we first generate heat using nuclear fission. It's a pretty amazing source of heat. And then we carry this heat to another place where you know, we, 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 trans, we, we basically convert it into steam and we spin a turbine and, and we output the electricity. Now, if we focus on these two first steps, um, when you generate the heat, you need to transfer it to the coolant so you can carry it somewhere else. Um, also a hint on um, Professor White's question on how to link the three talks. I guess um, uh, in some sense, we're all trying to generate heat and carry it and, and, and convert it um, in a safe manner. And in this, in this transfer here of heat, there is a champion. And the champion is boiling. I'm going to explain a little bit why. The typical picture that we all have in mind for boiling is this microscopic bubbles, right? But in fact, if we take a closer look at what happens at the base of these bubbles as they grow on a hot surface, the vapor inside the bubble doesn't touch the wall. Just like you right now sitting on a comfortable seat, or maybe not, um, the bubble sits on a very thin pillow of liquid. And this thin pillow of liquid is called a liquid microlayer. The liquid microlayer is very thin, at the order of 1 to 10 microns in thickness, and is very long, radius of hundreds of microns. So here we're talking about something that is 10 or 100 times thinner than a single human hair, right? So you, you wonder, like, why do we care about it, right? So let's take a look at the, at the wall. A heated wall where boiling occurs is hot, right? This is the green picture on the left. This is temperature. We are 20 degrees above saturation. This, this wall is hot. What you, what you notice, though, is those blue spots, those blue rings, those circular rings. Those, those blue rings there correspond to evaporating thin layers. Those microlayers evaporate at the base of the bubble. And you see how good they are at removing the heat from the surface. The temperature in those places is brought down to the minimal value it can be it's brought down to the saturation temperature. This is, this is a champion of heat transfer. Another figure of merit is the heat flux. The heat flux essentially is the quantity of heat that you can remove from a surface per unit surface per unit time. So the higher the value, the more efficient you cool down that surface. Now again, if you look at this picture, you see that away from these microlayers, you have you know, moderate heat fluxes. You remove heat to a moderate level, um, level one megawatt per square meter. Now, if you pay attention to those mi evaporating microlayers, you see that you enhance by a factor of four, five, ten. 
And this is why we care about such a thin layer. And the we is, in fact, a lot of people. Um, the first observation of microlayer was in 1961 by Moore. And I just highlighted a, a, a few uh, experimental and modeling work has been done since then. It's been over 50 years that people have put considerable amount of time and resources into understanding how these layer forms and evaporates. And today, what I'll show you, 2016, is the first generally applicable model for microlayer formation and the motion of contact lines. So I explain this in greater detail. This is not something I do on my own. Um, there's, a, there's a team working on this. There's two groups. We do computations, um, work with Professor Bongiorno here at MIT, uh, Professor Afkami in uh, New Jersey, and Professor Zaleski in Paris. Um, we work hand in hand with a group of experimentalists, um, mainly in Korea, Professor Kim and Sadbu Jong. They have a dedicated experimental facility where they ex directly measure these layers. Um, we also have in-house here at MIT, Reza, Matteo Bucci, and others that work on boiling experiments. And in fact, last week, last Friday, um, we went to the Green Lab together. We prepared a short video for you guys. We wanted to give you a, just a, a accurate, detailed look at a single bubble here at MIT. So what you're going to see on the left here is the actual video camera. So this video camera is a, is a bit expensive because it doesn't take a picture every second. It doesn't take 100 pictures every second. It takes 100,000 pictures every second. Now, the other thing that you see is the scale. Every pixel that you see in this image is 10 microns. So we inform the very um, small scales involved in the growth of bubbles there. Um, the, middle, the middle figure you'll see is the direct post-processing of that image into a binary image, black and white. And this black and white picture we convert. We convert it into uh, time evolution of the radius of that bubble. So you see on the left, this tiny bubble starts to grow. Post-process it here in white, the vapor. And on the right, you see the time evolution of that radius. Now, why, why this linear here, this, this line, is because we know for a very long time that the early stage is uh, close to linear. Uh, this is Mikic theory uh, 50 years ago. And I want you guys to have this in mind as we go to the computations now. What we're capable of doing today is solving for the flow where you have a vapor bubble that grows in a pool of liquid while tracking accurately the interface between the two. Now, this is challenging because you need to resolve the complex change in, in, in geometry of that interface in order to compute the surface tension force correctly. What you see here is a computation of a, an initial embryo of vapor, 10 microns. And you see the bubble will grow at that, at that linear rate that I showed you in the previous slide. And you'll pay attention to what happens. So this, this red curve is the interface between the two fluids. The bubble grows in the liquid. This is the wall at the bottom. And you kind of anticipate that we see something there. If we pay a closer look, now what you see, in fact, for the first time, by the way, is the formation of a thin liquid layer at the wall with the dimensions that are consistent with the experiment. This is a micron thick layer over hundreds of microns that is developing right there. Um, we don't stop here. We want to describe microlayer formation in a universal manner. What you see at the top there was time evolution. This thing was changing over time. Now, if you replace these axes, so the radius here and the actual axis, by two new axes there, so basically change of variables, you can find a universal behavior in the formation of the microlayer. This is what, what is a so-called a self-similar physical behavior of the microlayer formation. As the bubble grows, the layer forms, but all the layers can collapse into one single universal curve. So this here is the generally applicable correlation for microlayer formation. It's the first one. Um, and that, that's something that we're going to publish by the end of the spring. And the second thing to have in mind is there is a point at which all the three phases are in, in contact, right? This interface touches the wall somewhere. And this is a whole new physics there. This is physics of contact lines. We're looking at the hydrodynamics of a wedge of liquid moving. 
and trained by the macroscopic bubble. Right, what you see here is this blue dot is, the, is what is so-called the contact point. If we have a frame that looks at this contact point, that moves with the contact point, so this is the moving reference frame here, we're gonna move with it, we can look at the actual shape of that wedge of liquid. And what you see is after a short transient, then the wedge takes a shape and remains in this shape, and the wedge translates uh, outwards in trained by the bubble. So this is a moving reference. This is a moving reference frame. The question now is where this contact point moves. So to finalize the description here, um, you see after a short transient, so this contact point moves, um, that has an acceleration initially, then it reaches a steady, slow state. And what we did is we applied this methodology systematically uh, for all kinds of conditions that we encounter in boiling and basically show the behavior of moving contact lines for the case of microlia formation. Um, so we said 15 minutes, almost there. I wanted to summarize um, key things here. The first one is, um, you know, we have these five highlights of the department. I focus on the boiling one. I'm not the only one. This is a, this is a team computation and experiments. We work together. We find new understanding in the microscale boiling uh, phenomena, in particular the moving of contact lines, the motion of contact lines, and a generally applicable first correlation on the formation of microlayer. I included also a timeline at the bottom. Um, of course, this is not over yet. Um, there is a lot more to do, and that's why I, I extended the deadline to you know, five, 10 more years. Um, we open here a, a lot more um, to do, uh, in particular, including effects of, of the flow, for example. You, if you have a forced convection liquid on top of the hot surface, how does it affect the formation of these layers? Do you see an asymmetry in them? Can you quantify it? And the second is, we, in these simulations, we live in an ideal world where the you know, the liquid is pure. Uh, in the real life, you have surfactants and, and, and contaminants. So how does that impact the formation of those layers? Um, so this is where we're heading. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. It's amazing that we still don't understand how boiling works. <laughs> right. Yeah. Were there any questions? Sure. Can you give us a, a sense of what the physics is that leads to those seemingly universal shapes once the bubble is involved? You showed right. that evolution clearly of a model of the structure. So can you describe kind of at a high level what causes that those universal shapes? Um, so if you notice, what happens is we, first of all, we impose a static contact angle at the wall. In other words, the behavior at the wall remains the same as the bubble grows, right? So you should expect if you have a linear growth of the bubble with the same boundary condition, you should expect things to behave smoothly along this interface, uh, along the wall. And what we found, that you can find um, the dual problem is the impact of a droplet on the wall, right? Here we have a bubble that grows on the wall. The dual problem is the impact of a droplet on the wall. And they found also self-similar profiles in pressure at the impact. Um, so this is something that we expected from, from the problem itself. Yes, Professor. Can you say something about the stability of what you're looking at? Uh, is there a critical heat flux where things start going yes. haywire and right. things become chaotic? Right. You look at your time in mind. Uh, right. Does it go in some hot at all? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, see here, all this work is at um, moderate heat flux. When you have single bubbles, you can identify a single microlayer. Um, you don't see the effect of surrounding bubbles to it. Um, this is one of the next steps. Um, but what you were talking about is how the, the motion of these contact lines and this microlayer evaporation at some point is so critical that you no longer remove heat from the wall and you totally insulate insulate the whole surface, and then you reach the, the boiling crisis. This is, this is a case where the surface is very crowded. So there's a lot more of, you know, these, there is a regime where all these bubbles coalesce and all these contact lines coalesce. Um, 
This is a regime I haven't explored yet. What I can tell you more about is um, these cooling happens because there is a thickness. And you know, we can also discuss how this thickness changes as a function of, let's say, capillary number and things like this. And this is something that we discuss in our work. And you see that you can end up with thinner or thicker layer depending on the initial you know, superheat of the wall. Uh, and, and therefore, you can end up with different situations. You're going to reach the crisis before or later. Those are the things that we can discuss like, in a second time. Um, for now, what we do is we understand how things scale for a single bubble, and then we're going to generalize it. Yeah. Yes? You're taking 100,000 pictures a second each pixel is 10 microns. How much light do you have to blast to that camera to actually dissolve those bubbles? Um, that's a question for Matteo. Um, <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> you have to push the light very close to the bubble. Uh, let's, let's put it that way. Um, and what you see is the actual picture, right? So there's no trick here. So um, and you, you saw the picture. There's, there, there's not a lot of light. It's not bright. There is more, you know, we can do better. Uh, but for, for the, we wanted to put, I, I wanted to put something together for you guys today to have a clean, at least a clean bubble to show before showing um, computations. So, yeah. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again, and we're going to move Thank you.